Welcome to the History Unplugged podcast, the unscripted show that celebrates unsung heroes, myth busts historical lies, and rediscovers the forgotten stories that changed our world. I'm your host, Scott Rank. Probably the most daring rescue mission in American military history happened at a time when the American military was more unpopular than it had ever been. The year was 1972, and most people considered the Vietnam War a lost cause. Soldiers and airmen who returned home were called mercenaries at best, or baby killers at worst, and their cars would be keyed on Air Force bases. And it was in this year that Lieutenant Colonel Gene Hamilton was shot down behind enemy lines right during North Vietnam's Easter Offensive, and he was hiding out among 30,000 soldiers. This was one of the fiercest battles since World War II, but his rescue was so important that the U.S. put its entire counteroffensive military effort on hold. Why was rescuing him so important? That's because he carried highly classified information, and he knew secrets about cutting-edge missile technology and avionics that, if he'd been captured, could have changed the entire course of the Cold War itself. Branches of U.S. intelligence knew that there had been helicopters and planes shot down in Vietnam, and a year later, the exact same technology showed up in Soviet aircraft. Well, to talk about his rescue, I'm speaking today with author Stephen Talty, who's author of the new book, Saving Bravo, The Greatest Rescue Mission in Navy SEAL History. Stephen is the author of various books, including The Black Hand, Agent Garbo, and A Captain's Duty. And the last one was made into the movie Captain Phillips, Tom Hanks in it. And we get into the story of this rescue mission that involved South Vietnamese commandos and Tommy Norris, who won the Congressional Medal of Honor for this rescue. And it was so dangerous that 11 servicemen had died trying to save Hamilton. The rescue took a lot of courage. It involved the two men going in disguise as Vietnamese fishermen and taking a small boat upriver. But beyond a story of bravery, we get into the bigger question of the Vietnam War. What does it mean to talk about bravery and heroics when many of the men who are fighting the battle don't believe that it was a just cause? And the place of the Vietnam War in American history is a lot more confusing than something like World War II that's looked upon as a just war and good versus evil. So we get into a lot of these different issues. I really enjoyed this discussion. It's a great story, but it really makes you think from a macro historical level. So I hope you enjoyed this discussion with Stephen Talty. Stephen, welcome to the show. Great to be here. First of all, before we get into the story of Lieutenant Colonel Gene Hambleton, I'm curious, how did you find out about this story? This seems like something that I thought, hmm, how come I didn't hear about this before? You know, I was just looking um, at an article about rescue missions, something I'm, I've been interested in for a long time. Um, I just love those narratives. And it was one sentence about this famous uh, Vietnam rescue that I'd never heard about. And the thing that stuck out to me immediately was the fact that 11 men had died to get this one airman back. And um, I immediately thought... Um, what was motivating these guys, what was motivating the brass to send them out after such a horrific loss of, of men and material. But it was also interesting to me, the heroic acts in what is often considered an unheroic war an uncelebrated war. So I wanted to dig a little deeper and um, I found that uh, there had been a memoir, but it was largely fictionalized. And there had been a a movie where Gene Hamilton is played by Gene Hackman. Um, and ironically, they grew up about 10 miles apart from each other in Illinois. But that, too, had a lot of sort of invented characters and invented dialogue. And I just thought the real story was bound to be more interesting. So I started digging and I found two things that really were enormously helpful. An, an unpublished manuscript that he had written um, before the memoir was published, which con- contained really sort of the real story, the authentic details. And I also found that some of the guys who had gone out on the rescue and made it back, some had been POWs for a year or more, were still alive. Um, the families of 11 men who had died over there trying to get Gene Hamilton back were around and eager to talk, and their stories had never really been told. So it was really kind of, um, you know, for a, a researcher and a writer, it was kind of an embarrassment of riches that, that was just kind of waiting there. Well, something that you mentioned there, I'm curious about, you said it was an unpopular war, and we were talking about this a little before we hit record, that on a meta level, there's stronger headwinds with a Vietnam War story than a World War II story, 
because of its unpopularity. Did you notice that at all when you were researching this compared to, let's say, the story of Captain Phillips, where Captain Phillips, I suppose it's tied in very loosely to the war on terror, but there's at least a bit more public support than the Vietnam War. Did you get any sense of that researching it, that there were stronger headwinds? I did. Um, even among the guys I interviewed who had been there in 72, um, often talked about growing up on John Wayne films. Um, these were films really inspired by World War II and the idea of a good war and good men fighting a good war. And they often measured themselves against those films and against John Wayne. And I, I can't tell you how many times these guys talked about um, – sort of wanting a John Wayne moment, wanting their service to be sort of meaningful in the history of this country and admirable. And if you're over there in 71 or 72, you know that the war, that the, the country is in large part turned against the war. Um, a lot of these guys would come home on leave and find um, if their cars had a, a sticker on the bumper that's, you know, mentioned their air base that they were flying out of, the car might be keyed. Um, that might be eggs on the window. It was very clear to them that they weren't fighting that, that World War II kind of conflict. Um, so for, and I think that actually plays into the rescue. We can get into this later, but they knew that this was in France in 1944 and this wasn't D-Day and they weren't going to liberate people who welcomed them with open arms. That kind of, that kind of feeling was, was long gone among the South Vietnamese. They've been fighting for so many years. Uh, many of them just wanted the war ended. So back home, they weren't getting the kind of um, support they wanted. Even among the Vietnamese, they, they sensed exhaustion um, and this, this desire to sort of get on to the next stage. So what they ended up doing was really fighting for each other. And the rescue mission, at least among the guys themselves, developed out of this feeling that um, – especially if the war is not um, being celebrated and in a certain way is not going to be won, then the only thing we can do that is heroic or that has significance and meaning is take care of each other. And that's why many of them went out there after several guys had died, risked their own lives to get their brother back because the war itself was not going to give their service meaning. So the rescue had to kind of fill in for that. Did you get that sense when you were talking to the families of these servicemen that they had that sense on these rescue missions? I sure did. Um, and one of the guys who was over there said that um, the first thing that a soldier in country told him once he got over there, a commanding officer said, this war is not worth one American life. And that's not something you would have heard probably, you know, in uh, in London in 1942 or 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 even during the Korean War. Right. Um, so they knew that this was a different kind of conflict. And um, what one of them told me was, was that getting one of our guys back gave me a feeling like winning the Super Bowl. And it was the only time you had that feeling over there, um, that this was something that he could sort of look back on and tell his grandkids about and just have a feeling in his, in his chest that, that I had done something significant today. So they were all yearning for that. They were all, you know, these guys were often in their late 20s, 30s, even 40s. Gene Hamilton was 52. So these weren't like the 18-year-olds that we think of in Apocalypse Now who are, you know, who are disillusioned with the war but sort of being sent into the rat holes. These guys had experience. They had a, an esprit de corps that was really admirable. And they just weren't going to leave one of their guys behind. Yeah, and I think we'll come back to this because I get lots of audience questions about World War II, even though the vast majority were born long after the war took place. So it's just very interesting, the act of writing history about a war that doesn't have this type of self-mythologizing and triumphalism that other wars do. But let's get into the crux of the matter, and that's Lieutenant Colonel Hamilton himself. So can you describe him to me, and why was he so important that— there was such an extensive rescue mission sent after him. Well, he'd been in the service in the Air Force for almost 30 years, and he'd been through, for instance, five or six generations of American radar systems, and he knew them in and out. Um, but he'd also done um, time in Strategic Air Command um, and worked as a missile guy. He was one of the, the men who worked on the Titan II and ended up over in Turkey, actually, during the Cold War, uh, commanding a missile battery. Uh, missile site. So 
during the Cold War, things were sort of changing from land armies, et cetera, to, to a missile concept of warfare. And the whole idea is, is the Soviet Union going to hit us before we hit them? And where are they going to hit us? So Gene Hamilton knew the target list in the Soviet Union of where our ICBMs would be flying and hitting. And that in itself would have been of immense value to the Soviet Union in sort of conducting their war and placing their missiles and placing their, you know, their defense systems. So over 30 years and being in the strategic guard and command, knowing radar, knowing the missile strategy of the United, of the United States, um, he would have been a valuable guy to capture. He would have been um, someone that the KGB who did have agents in Hanoi would have been eager to interrogate. So even beyond the, the loyalty that his, his fellow airmen felt to him, the Pentagon at a higher level wanted him back. And um, that was sort of motivating their moving, you know, moving mountains to get him um, back behind uh, safe lines. And when he was shot down, can you describe that? It was in the North Vietnamese Eastern Offensive. Is that correct? It is. It, it's sort of a forgotten battle. It's, um, it was really the largest offensive bo- um, of the war on the enemy side. Um, they poured 30,000 troops, a lot of um, Soviet tanks, uh, armored vehicles, um, missile systems. This was not a ragtag Viet Cong army. This was a mechanized infantry army coming down into South Vietnam. And they wanted to sort of humiliate Richard Nixon and his whole idea of, of Vietnamization, of giving the war over to the, to the South Vietnamese. And so they wanted to show that uh, that policy was bankrupt and they were going to take provincial capitals. They were going to kill a lot of South Vietnamese and they were really hoping to either end the war or get to the negotiating, negotiating table on very favorable terms. So this was a big deal. And it had just begun when um, Hamilton got in his aircraft with, with six other guys and um, I'm sorry, with five other guys and flew over the DMZ and that's where they were shot down. So, he was hit by a SAM missile. The airplane basically disintegrated. He looked down and he could see clouds beneath his feet where the cockpit floor used to be. Um, and he parachuted out at very high altitude and came down and basically the largest enemy offensive of the war. What happened after he landed on the ground? Well, he, it was near dusk. He started looking immediately for cover because he knew that, um, you know, the military would be sending rescue hel- helicopters after him immediately. That was the policy in Vietnam. The, the helicopter, the Huey, had really changed the game. They no longer needed to send a squadron of men as they would have in World War II. They would send helicopters guarded by fighter jets and uh, perhaps even supported by um, artillery guns from the Navy ships uh, offshore. And they wanted to grab these guys immediately before they fell into enemy hands. So he was expecting really to be rescued that night or maybe early the next morning. But because of this enemy offensive, which really the Americans were just starting to learn about, he was surrounded by SAM missile batteries, by intense anti-aircraft fire. Um, And just something that the intensity of which um, a lot of the aviators over there hadn't even experienced yet. So he was really in a tough fix. And he sought cover that night, buried himself in a little hole that he dug out, um, you know, checked his supplies, and he had a survival radio. So he was in touch with the forward air controller. So by that evening, um, he was in place, ready to be rescued, but he had no idea really what that was going to take. Could you uh, describe what he would be expecting with a um, Air Force rescue? You're looking for a helicopter. If you're on the ground, how would you signal to them your location without raising more attention from enemy forces? Well, he had um, a Ford air controller, and they were doing it by basically the the air controller would fly over in his plane, and he would hit his radio button when the guy passed immediately over him. So they would do that two or three times, and the guy had him basically his coordinates down on the map. He knew exactly what grove of trees the guy Hamilton was in. Um, So once they had that, they had the coordinates, um, they could direct all their aircraft that way. And in his survival pack, Hamilton had smoke. So once the helicopters got close, he was, he had those um, smoke canisters out and ready to pull the tab. And that would sort of take the pilots in the last 
50 or 100 yards to the rescue. Here he is 